Good morning and welcome back to what is essentially the first day of the uh, Energy Sovereignty Project. Uh, we kicked everything on yesterday, uh, went to uh, full uh, self-powered mode in the app uh, at midnight last night, or at midnight on, on the, the first. Um, and the reason I say this is really the first day of the Energy Sovereignty Project is because this is the first time that we're actually able to see what happened to the system. So um, yesterday we produced through solar 24.6 kilowatts of, of power from the roof and the home use was 33 kilowatts. So about what I was saying, you know, we're right in that kind of a, a 8 kilowatt a day uh, deficit number. Uh, this time of year. Uh, starting off yesterday we had 100% that obviously held through the peak uh, production of the day we just kept the batteries topped off and uh, right now we're sitting at uh, 73%. Now the sun's coming up so that's the first number that's of importance when we're when we're doing our planning for you know looking at you know how if one were to design a program for how this system would operate autonomously, that would be a very important number. You'd be looking at um, home consumption, you'd be looking at um, uh, how much power was produced, and then how much energy was consumed until dawn. That gives you a, a kind of a strikeout number for um, how far you just have to get to if you're going to continue to, uh, continue to run the home. So that's an important number. But an even more important number is where the battery capacity is when we're done charging for the day. And so yesterday we charged from 7.40 in the morning to right around 4.30 uh, in, the, in the afternoon was when we got our, our last gasp of, of charge. It peaked just before noon. Bring up this chart and kind of see that, uh, uh, those three. So uh, that end of day is really important. Uh, peak, peak could be important too, I suppose, but the end of day, that's a real important time to each day when you're done producing solar, where's your battery? What percentage is your battery? Uh, it would be nice if the battery measured in kilowatts, but I know why they don't do that. Um, it's just one of those things that as the battery degrades or as it goes through seasonal changes, right now it's bitterly cold, it dropped a little freezing slightly yesterday, uh, last night and so uh, um, we're in a garage so uh, you know maybe that mitigates the, uh, uh, the temperature effects on the battery somewhat. It's still really cold in here so again we'll get a real world, uh, real world kind of flavor for, for how the uh, seasons might affect the, the battery. But again, so for that reason, it's obvious why they went with a percentage rating. And that's fine, because as you'll see, it won't really matter for our numbers. You all will still be able to follow along because we're going to track the, uh, um, uh, the actual performance numbers of, uh, uh, of the gear. How much, goes, how much power goes into the uh, um, power wall versus how much we're able to get out of it. <clears throat> so um, let's check back in a... Uh, uh, in, a few hours we'll check back at uh, 4 30 when the system quits and then we'll close out the day by going back into the studio and running through the numbers and looking at some charts all right well here we are checking back into the uh, uh, checking back into the system you're going to hear me use a term from uh, now on called uh, a total solar day and Total solar day is really important. That's the period of time from when your system stops producing solar power to when it stops producing solar power the following day. Um, that is going to be um, something that's going to be absolutely critical as you'll see as we start to go into this uh, more and more uh, from the standpoint of all of your calculations that you're going to be making. It's a, basically, it's a, it's a firm decision point when you measure that period of time and how much power you've created versus how much you've used in that specific period of time, that will then allow you to then predict how the system should react for the coming days, that kind of thing. So 
I'm gonna go ahead and give just a really quick overview here and then we're gonna go back to the studio and I'm going to crunch some numbers, figure out what it all means and then we can discuss it over, uh, over an absinthe or two. But basically, wow, I'm very, very impressed with the uh, performance of the system from this past total solar day. In other words, from uh, the first where solar production ended till today when solar production ended. Um, you'll recall from earlier that I, uh, uh, I set the system to start its self-powered mode at midnight on, uh, on, on the first. That was symbolic but stupid, obviously, because you'll use a little bit of power during the day, but obviously, you know, once the power starts to come in, once the solar starts to produce, you'll very quickly recoup all of that and then just start burping power out the, uh, out the lines, which is exactly what we did. I wound up putting a little bit of that in the, uh, in the car. But basically the thing to note was is that when the solar was still contributing, in other words, the, it, it was charging the batteries. It wasn't um, being scavenged from the house in any way. We were at 100%. As the battery started to supply the house, so then we were co-supplying the house with both solar and what the battery was producing, it dropped it down to 99%. Um, so um, that was where we started the total solar day on the first, where production ended, the battery was sitting at 99%. Well, today, I watched it as it uh, uh, as it dropped in the morning, you know, over the course of the entire evening, actually, you know, and then the morning uh, as well, and uh, it had dropped down to about 79 percent. I'm going to say 79. It did touch kind of 78, but then it jumped right back up. So we'll say 79 percent. So that's a 20 percent drop prior to solar producing then it recovered it hit solar production so right now for our total solar day the system is sitting at 91 percent that's impressive that's impressive and so when you do crunch those numbers and you look at that as being a 10 percent loss nears makes no difference um, that actually equates really well to what we know the, the total available capacity of the, uh, uh, of the system is, or at least should be, which is slightly over 80 kilowatt hours. Yesterday, we had, you know, from total solar day, right, that period, um, we had a uh, eight kilowatt hour deficit, which is it com it's completely in line nearly to the kilowatt of what, uh, uh, nearly to the kilowatt hour of what we uh, uh, should have seen. So very impressive, very impressive. Um, we'll continue to watch this over the next uh, over the next few days, and uh, uh, and see what happens. Is it, these next few days are not going to be ideal. Tomorrow we may lose potentially an entire day's production because we'll be doing maintenance on the system. Uh, SunWorks is coming to try and get the uh, issue with the uh, uh, inverter worked out. Hopefully they they're able to uh, to solve that. But again, if it gets solved quickly, we're great. We could lose an entire day, and then the next two days are going to be rainy. All right. So it's going to be interesting to see how the system copes with that. Because what we know now in winter, what we see here, if we have a sunny day, that we run that roughly eight kilowatt hour or so deficit. We uh, 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 yesterday we produced, I think it was uh, uh, 23.6, I think it was, and then we used 33, so you know, right in that, you know, exactly what we expected to see. But we also know that we lose 20% a day. If you don't feed it with anything, uh, prior to solar production, from when it ended to when it began, we were, you know, we were down uh, approximately at 20%. So, how many days you can do that while supplying little, I guess we'll find out. So we'll see what happens over those uh, next couple of rainy days. So uh, let's, go back to the, uh, let's go back to the studio. I'm gonna take uh, a couple of hours before I uh, start the uh, 
uh, start the, the, the recording session over at the studio, uh, give me time to crunch some numbers and really uh, take a, allow us to take a closer look at this total solar day from the first to the second. Welcome back. So here we're back in the uh, back in the studio after what's been quite a interesting couple of days. Um, so uh, um, wow, um, we've obviously kicked things off. Um, we, as I mentioned, we on the uh, on the on midnight of the first, we set everything to its self-powered mode, so we would as much as possible leave the leave the grid out of it. And uh, the initial tests were basically to try and um, confirm whether or not I, I was on the right track. About a year, year and a half ago, uh, I had identified two key factors that I, just, that I felt were going to be uh, um, uh, key factors in um, being able to predict how the system would respond to various times of years, various conditions, and that kind of thing. When you try to do that, the more variables you can neck down into one indicator or a few key indicators, the better off you'll be as far as being efficient with the, the system. Now, whether or not you're going to try and design an algorithm to do this or whether or not you're going to actually look at it and make the predictions and the manual uh, adjustments yourself, the fact remains is, is that if you have all of these other variables out there, and you can all have them mean one or two things that you can then look at, it's gonna make this task a whole lot easier. And let's go over two of the ones that I identified. So in the, uh, in the last video, you heard me talk about uh, reference to the, sol the total solar day. That period in time uh, between uh, when you stop making any additional solar on one day and when you stop making additional solar the following day. The amount of degradation that you see, the amount of depletion in the battery that you see over that specific period of time is, is actually very, very helpful. And there's, uh, there's one other uh, one here, but let's go ahead and, and, and go through some of these, uh, uh, some of these here. Um, the main reason for this specific video is, is that I've seen a lot of videos that were entitled Living with the Tesla Powerwall. What it's like to live with a Tesla Powerwall. A Powerwall after three months. And all of those, they were very well intended and great videos, but they tend to just kind of show you a power bill. And go, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're great. Works great. And I'm sure it does. And I think also that where those systems involve only one or two power walls, their expectations of the system are a lot different than somebody who's looking at doing a system for energy sovereignty where you've got three, four, five, six power walls. So uh, as great as those videos are, let's take a real look at living with a uh, Tesla Powerwall too. We've already seen some of the pitfalls of the software and how they have um, manipulated the system so that it's in compliance with what regulators wanted it to do rather than what the uh, consumer actually needs it to do. Uh, but those things are fixable. Those are not long-term issues. Those are up to us as consumers and as voters to uh, make sure that those, those things get uh, get taken care of. But uh, let's start uh, untangling what we know. So the first thing I want to say is that I am very, very impressed with the overall performance of the Tesla Powerwall 2. Um, when looking at the percentage of degradation measured against what I know the capacity to be, 
at least as far as what's published, and what I know my losses were. You know, I, I know what the home's use was. I know how much solar was was produced. Man, it's really close. They did a great job of also of reporting accurately what apparently went went in and what comes out. Um, so just great respect for the, the the equipment itself the actual the physical power wall and how it does what it does so I wanted to get that uh, that straight out and the other thing that I'd really like to uh, um, throw a shout out as being laudable on our scale that we came up with um, is the software itself and the way they lay out the graphs and it's just it's very well done it's very well done. I, I, I like it. I'll, I'll be pulling up many of these uh, uh, many of these graphs. Um, but uh, let's uh, let's start by walking through these past two days, and that'll give everybody kind of an idea of what's going on. So obviously, just before New Year's Eve, I set the system to self power, reserve power um, outage. You know, reserve the power for outage setting uh, at zero percent. Uh, that's showing there. This is the. Uh, setting uh, and it's showing uh, that slight gap between when I set it just a little bit before midnight it took it uh, about an hour or so um, here's a couple more uh, screenshots from uh, that morning of the first there and uh, so it started out at hundred percent just after midnight and uh, uh, then the power flow went to that um, self-powered mode everything was uh, working really good so now the, the first question in my mind after doing that at midnight was how much would I deplete the battery before charging it again? Um, if, oddly enough, I was hoping that it would be quite a bit because I need freeboard now because it's going to start charging very rapidly and in a short period of time it's going to be able to lay on basically the, uh, enough charge to carry me through the, uh, the entire day minus a bit. Um, and so what that would mean and exactly what we saw here is is that uh, it would return it to 100% fairly early and then I'd just wind up sputtering power back to the uh, back to the grid and so what I did was I actually used the car to uh, um, kind of eat up uh, a little bit of that um, by plugging it in to charge and setting the the current relatively low, but here we show right here by 2:22 we were 2:22 uh, p.m. we were back to 100% in the battery, and I just started to kind of burp it down. And so then um, now you know we start talking about well where does our solar day start? Okay, so the solar day um, in this instance here um, started right around 2:23 ish. And that isn't where it end, where our production ended, but what an important part to watch is this. And so this is where the system is balanced. I'm using the same amount from the home as I am producing in solar. And so then that cuts the battery out. That's where your charge stops. So now you're not laying on any more charge. Well, the reason why we want to make sure that we calculate the solar day, total solar day, from when your power stops producing entirely because of this. This next one here, that actually shows that the draw off of the battery actually starts before the um, solar completely goes away from the, uh, from the equation. So we want to make sure that we include those shoulders in, both in ramping up and ramping down uh, for the day's production. We'll talk a little bit more about the shoulder when we uh, close out the video here. But at the start of the uh, first solar day, um, we were at 99%. It had degraded the battery just a little bit, again, because of those shoulder losses. And so uh, um, here, this screenshot here, um, this uh, uh, was taken the next day. So ignore the, the timestamp on it. Uh, it's historical data from the entire day's, uh, uh, previous day's production. Um, and the graph is from uh, 2.30 p.m. on the 1st. And so what you can see from that first one there is that that's the start of that critical time period that I was talking about. And so now what we're going to do, let's go ahead and pull up a, a, a full graph showing both days together. So here we go. Um, so now 
let's talk about what we know about all of this. Well, we know our starting point is 99%, and we know that it's going to be sunny the next couple of days. We also know that our projected loss, uh, just from what we've seen historically from the amount of production and the amount of home use, is going to wind up being somewhere between 8 and 10 kilowatt hours. And so uh, now we can kind of allow this to run its course, pull up the next one here, boom. Um, so uh, now we have a bit more information to plug in. We know that for that total solar day that our loss right there was between 99% shown and 91% on, uh, on the battery. And so now we know, given a sunny day in January, that that's exactly correct. That's exactly what we can expect. You know, an 8 to 10% drop. Talk about that in a minute, how that equates back. But um, we know something else, too. So here, when we pull this graph up, and so now this shows the, uh, um, uh, if you look at that 79% there, that's the amount of percentage that dropped off of the battery before it started to charge the next day. So that's from, like the graph shows, from the time where production ended the previous day till just before production starts. And this is our kind of a, um, this is that, that kind of a, oh, we've, we made it uh, uh, number. You know, we, we, we just got there by the skin of our teeth. And so that shows that 20% drop that you might expect to see on that last day if you think that you're going to go ahead and, and squeeze every last bit out of your power wall you do need to make sure that you have enough freeboard so that you can make it the entire way to that next production period and that does not necessarily mean that you will make it to the next day all it means is that you will make it to that day where you can then recover and make it then perhaps on part into part of the evening depends on the size of your system, it depends on what time of year it is. Obviously, as you see here, the system's fairly large, 10 kilowatts and six friggin' power walls. But um, that number is also going to be a very important number to factor in. But between those two, that's basically all you need to do a pretty good job of predicting how many days you will have with any given amount of charge in the power wall. Now there's some caveats that go along with that. Um, the reason that I feel confident about it, again, is back to what we were saying before. This is the result of a lot of different variables all coming together. And it's one that's very easy to understand. Now, the caveat that I was talking about is, is that that is listed in percentage. And we're basing a great deal of this on that percentage being linear. Now, I expect that, the bat that these batteries, that percentage, is going to be very linear now. But it will also be very interesting to see in a year from now, and two years from now, how that is maintained. As the batteries degrade, do we wind up seeing more of a fall off uh, uh, in, uh, in the, the lower percentages? Um, do we see a fall off from various temperatures? That'll be an interesting thing to do. You to see, um, we'll track this, you know, as the, the battery degrades, we'll, uh, you know, as it depletes, rather, and then we'll measure that against the amount of known losses, and we'll see if those known losses track to what we're seeing as that uh, depletion that occurs over these, over these next few days. It'll be interesting to see. And then to see how that relates to this the same thing happening in summertime. Um, do we have some trail off near the, uh, near the end this time of year because it's cold and maybe not later on in the year? We don't know what we don't know, so that's why we're doing this. But just these two pieces of data alone arm us with some pretty powerful predictive tools. And uh, this is really kind of only the beginning of what we know. So let's, uh, um, uh, let's take a look at some other hard numbers for these uh, past couple of days. So, Boom, here we go, and now, I remember you were telling you about that, that, the shoulder losses, right? That time between when the, um, uh, when the homes 
use is eating up your solar production, right? Uh, and in the morning when, the, the, when you're still supplying some battery power as solar is blossoming, as it's coming up higher and higher and higher, and, and the amount of draw on the battery then becomes less. So those shoulder periods are important here. If we look at these raw numbers that we've got, it puts a hard, kind of a hard number to our deficit numbers. So you can see that you've got that first drop that we were discussing is between a 99% and a 91% drop. When we calculate that out, um, uh, we're, uh, we're looking at uh, the, um, uh, a, a calculated drop since it's 10% of right around that 8 kilowatt range. And so here's what I found really interesting. So the, uh, if you look at the um, amount that the power wall was charged and the amount that was removed from it, you've got 18 kilowatt hours that was removed and 11.3 kilowatt hours were returned. Now that gives you that difference between, uh, between the two of 6.8 kilowatt hours. Well, that's not eight kilowatt hours, is it? Well, but then we have an additional 1.6 kilowatt hours in those shoulder losses that I was telling you about, the time where the, where the system is still trying to uh, balance itself out. And it's interesting how those, uh, uh, how those added up. Uh, so obviously, as you can see here, um, when you directly subtract the solar production from the uh, home solar use, then we get 8.4 kilowatt hours. Right? And that's why it's better to use that, that, that total drop in percentage rather than um, uh, trying to go by the raw numbers where you get that 6.8 kilowatt hour uh, um, uh, difference. Uh, and so, and again, that's why that didn't, uh, uh, didn't match up. Uh, but in the end it does. So then when you look at those, when you look at those shoulder losses, I was stunned that it was so close that, I mean, it's just, it's gonna be interesting to try and tease out line losses. Uh, so that may that may take a little bit longer than I thought, uh, in in a good way, uh, to try and figure out what our uh, what our losses are because they seem to be uh, at this point they seem to be rather minimal. And again, I'm going to go back and say it again: the graphs that uh, uh, Tesla has on their app, laudable. The way the information is laid out, really good. They spend a lot of time. Obviously, they spend a lot of time uh, laying that out. Um, the only problem that I can see with it is, is that they don't have a lot of historical data. Uh, I would like to be able to go on their website and just like I do with the uh, um, with my webpage for uh, my solar edge inverter, I'd like to be able to go back and see a year's worth of data. I think that would be very helpful. So uh, I'm going to close this out now. There's really not that much more to, to say about this uh, until we have a few more days under our belt. And then we'll be able to kind of log a few days. Uh, it might be about a week before I actually do another video on the trending. Um, we lost quite a bit of solar production today because we had to tease out a, a problem with the uh, solar edge inverter, which we did. I'll do a separate video on that um, and uh, uh, let you guys know what, what happened there. But uh, now we've also got a couple of days that are going to be pretty cloudy and pretty rainy. And so I don't, it, it'll be interesting to see if we can get past those days with the amount of charge that we have and the amount of uh, production that we do on a, on a cloudy day. I'll present that to you guys uh, as well next week. But um, as far as checking how linear the decline is and all of that, I may have to do another round of charging up the, the batteries off of nothing but the solar that's allowed uh, and also be able to give some more information on that since the equipment isn't going to allow you to charge off of the grid. We'll have to work and work, see how we'll work the best with what it will allow us to do. So with that, thanks for joining in. Uh, again, as I always say, if, uh, if this is the first video that you've managed to stumble across, watch some of the other videos and we will uh, um, keep bringing these uh, uh, bringing these to you and thanks for tuning in